When you were a kid, did you ever have to wear hand-me-downs? Yeah? You know, those pieces of clothing that somebody else wore but didn't wear out, that still had some good use in them? See, I was rather lucky in being the oldest boy in a long line of cousins. I remember an Easter outfit that I had, had a blue jacket and shorts uh, that was just about worn by every male child in our extended family over about 25 years. <laughs> every family has a kid standing in that blue outfit, just like the one that I had when I was a kid. It came with a little bow tie, which probably is where I got my preference for them, and a pair of white shoes. Uh, in family albums, like I said, the entire extended family has those cute little pictures of that outfit. And finally, the time came around to get that outfit to my brother. Well, you see, my brother was a bigger child than I was, and yet he was still stuffed into that outfit. <laughs> and, and I can remember that time on Easter Sunday when he was being put in it, and my father said, well, if the shoe fits, well, it didn't fit my brother very well, but he wore it anyway. And I think the suit still is living somewhere in New Jersey. <laughs> I think every once in a while, some kid shows up in it. Uh, I assume that uh, that's the way it was with many, many families, that those kind of clothings just never really went away. And now you may be wondering, how does this relate to my story? Well, this morning's scripture lesson is a, a kind of unique one, but I think it would be one to which my father would say, if the shoe fits, when it comes to the end. Jesus is, as I said, continuing to tell parables about people doing what God wanted done. And last week it was about two brothers and this, uh, who uh, refused to go to work and then finally did or didn't go to work. And this week it's about a landowner and a rented vineyard. The vineyard is built by this landover, lone landowner and made into a pretty modern place. He puts in a, a, a place to crush the berries and to watch over them, a cower, and, and all the things are there. And he finds people who want to rent it. And unfortunately, when the harvest is ready to be reaped, the tenants had other ideas. The landowner sends servants to collect what was due, and they beat the slaves, they kill the slaves, they stone the slaves. And then a second round of servants are sent, and they treat them in exactly the same manner. And then finally, the owner decides to send his son, thinking that surely these tenants would respect his blood kin. And unfortunately, their first thought when they see the son coming down the road is that if they kill this young man that is to inherit this property, then it will surely fall to them. And so they kill the son. And then Jesus asks his listeners, what will that landowner do to the tenants? And of course, the ones listening say, well, of course, that landowner is going to kill those wretches, going to throw them out of the garden, beat them up, send them on their way, and find new tenants that will give the landowner what's his due. And Jesus knew that that would be their response because these were people who were into justice and rules. And then he does something that really throws them off. He quotes Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And this was the Lord's doing, and it's amazing in our eyes. And all of a sudden, the bells and the whistles go off in their heads. He's not talking about a story. He's talking about us. What a realization. And immediately their first response is to have him arrested and maybe even be stoned uh, to get him out of the way. And then they think, oh, wait a minute. Uh, if we do that, the people will rise up because they think of Jesus as a, a prophet, a man of God. And in what Jesus was saying, we have the history of Israel's constant rejection of God's messengers. God sends time after time prophets down through their history 
with a common message calling for repentance and renewal. And time after time, that theological thread is repeated as prophets are killed and stoned and beaten. He sends the prophets, God's servants, with a call to repentance. And those prophets, like John the Baptist, were killed by the leaders of the nation, by people who rose up. What truly scared the opponents of Jesus as he told this story was that their recognition was, hey, Jesus is saying perhaps that he's directly connected to this landowner, that somehow the landowner had sent his son to speak to the old tenants. Jesus, apparently, they felt, was implying that they were the old tenants and perhaps even suggesting that he was the son of the landowner. And it's no wonder that they were upset because Jesus, if he was claiming to be the son of God, was blaspheming. He was doing something that they all knew was impossible. No one could claim to be the son of God. And yet, I think that's what Jesus was implying that these leaders of the people were the old tenants and they were going to lose their special place, their special situation, and be replaced by new tenants. This parable must have brought great joy to the new church as it sought to understand their role in the journey of faith. These new followers of Jesus were to become the new tenants. And the parable serves not only as a warning to the high priests and Pharisees, but a joyful message to the early church that they were being called into the vineyard to be tenants and workers of God, the owner. But notice that it's workers and tenants. They were to come not in a position of privilege, but a call to service. If you think that being a tenant allows you to live off the fat of the land and and to have some kind of special pride in being so special, then you might want to rethink what it means to be the tenant working in the vineyard. Because the tenant is one who is required to produce the fruit of God, requires service. And one expects to then return the profits, the produce, to the owner of the vineyard. That's that's an exciting moment to realize that's the call. It gives us a purpose in our experience to know that what we do is pleasing in the sight of God. So here we are, God calling new tenants to work in the vineyard. And in the process, when the son of the landowner comes to receive his part of the harvest, there will be great rejoicing and thanksgiving. So, I would say to you, if the shoe fits, you might consider putting it on. Let us pray. Eternal, all-powerful God, we often miss the point that as new tenants we are called to a special place, a place where life is full, a place where there is work to be done, a place where we are called to be your people. O Lord, give us that light that we might follow, give us that strength that we might care, give us the ability to serve as your people. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.